Hello, my name is Ran and this is the Flow Artists Podcast. Every episode we interview inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow. This week's episode features a recorded conversation between myself, Joe Stewart and Donna Sparks. Donna is a Melbourne-based hoop dance teacher with a uniquely creative approach. In this conversation, we hear about Donna's background in sculpture, creative writing and youth work, and how these disciplines inform her teaching today. We learn how Donna's approach uses play as a foundation for learning and connection and encourages individual expression. We also learn about some of the systems Donna has devised over the years to help her manage her busy schedule, including some helpful healthy eating tips for people on the go. There is some fantastic information in this podcast, so be sure to listen right to the end. But before we get on with it, I would just like to quickly ask you to please subscribe or rate the Flow Artist Podcast on iTunes, Podcaster, Stitcher, or wherever you find your podcasts. It would really help us get the word out there. Now, one final bit of housekeeping. After this episode, we will be going to a fortnightly release schedule. So watch out for our next episode in two weeks. I'll be back after the interview. Stick around for our picks of the week. Donna Sparks, good to have you here. Just wondering if you could perhaps start by giving us a little bit of your background and maybe where you grew up. Ooh, I grew up in a town called Apollo Bay in mm-hmm. the Otways, about 15 minutes drive from the beach. So I was surrounded by forest with the beach accessible. And Sounds pretty nice. It was pretty nice and no other houses in sight. So there was a lot of freedom in that. Not much TV reception. So we got ragwort ads and weed killer ads or ABC. <laughs> so there was a lot of time that was about entertaining ourselves and creating play in that space. And so you grew up like a pretty creative kid. Yeah. Yeah. And always movement based stuff or more kind of writing and drawing and games I think probably drawing and writing and making jewellery and playing with Fimo. I don't know if Fimo yeah. is that anymore, but <laughs> it is making yeah. stuff out of Fimo and then selling What's it. Fimo? At, it's like a it's like a plasticine that you bake and oh, then it goes hard, hard like oh, plastic in amazing right. colours. Oh. Yeah, it's really strong, so you could make jewellery out of it and wear it. Nice, but not stretchings because it rots your ears. Ooh. Apparently. Ooh. Not that I would know anything about that. Um, <laughs> and, and then selling that sort of stuff at the local market, which is how we got pocket money. And that was the only time we were really allowed lollies. Oh, so that was good. Make sense. something, <laughs> sell it for 20 cents and go and get some lollies. And so were you always comfortable speaking and performing in front of a crowd? Were there plays and things when you were growing up? I was never comfortable acting. I was comfortable doing creative dance. And I was pretty comfortable, I think, in front of a crowd, but I'm still not comfortable performing. Yeah, that's not where you find your joy. It is. I just don't... I don't know. I have a strange relationship with performance. I like performing in a group. Yes. Solo is different, unless it's not on stage, and then I'm fine. And also filming yourself you seem very comfortable with, and putting that out there. All of that is fine. It's something about the moment where you're the performer, and you... In my head, you have to be this thing, which is not true. I have to be me and express myself in that way. Which is exactly what you teach to people which as is what well. I teach. <laughs> it's when we always teach what we need to learn ourselves. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I know you've got a degree in creative arts and you've also studied sound production and creative writing as well as circus. Do each of these movements express a different aspect of you or like represent a different time in your mm. life? Or how does it all interweave? So... I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that. Please do. I have a creative arts degree with a major in sculpture and creative writing. And the reason I like sculpture, I feel like connects to my movement practice because it's tactile. So to create sculpture, you have to physically be in it, amongst it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then sound production was around creating music because I was a live electronic music producer and also DJ for a while, which also connected to dance and movement. And, you know, I'd be the kind of 
DJ who'd look for who's not dancing and see what I needed to do to get them to move. Oh. So I kind of played in that way from the background. And then I also did a cert for in training assessment, training and assessment, youth work and drug and alcohol. So the teaching stuff always came naturally and that's why I sort of got the qualification to sort of follow that. Then the youth work and community development is because I'm really interested in what happens when there's a group working together in a class environment or in a workshop or in a creative space or even in a corporate environment. I've kind of played with like group dynamics in that space because I think there's a level of creativity that can come out of that and also people will often find themselves doing things they might not do if they're alone. Like that person who didn't want to get up on the dance floor. (laughs) Yeah. And it's because of like this power of the group and I feel like that all of those things have informed my practice and particularly my interest and passion in working with people. Yeah, I could imagine how rewarding and satisfying that would be, especially if you haven't met the people initially and then seeing them come together and seeing them blossom and seeing them grow. Mm. And go outside their comfort zone that they walked in with. Yeah. You know, like the kid who comes in and is known as the person who disrupts and is constantly told off who then finds their leadership role through circus and through play and by being allowed to be this character that -hmm. everyone then supports rather than rejects. And so have you got any strategies for dealing with that more challenging person? I have many strategies. A lot of it is intuitive and around the energy of the group, but particularly if there's someone who is wanting to be heard and wanting to speak over and wanting to... And you can see a group getting really frustrated with that person because they want to learn they're there to do this workshop and there's someone being disruptive so I often invite the disruptive person to support me in running the group so if someone's being really disruptive and they seem quite creative and like they're wanting to do handstands off to the side and Mm -hmm. I'll be like great so can you just help me out and physically express what it is I'm trying to explain to the group so you acted out silently beside me And communicate with your body what I'm communicating with my voice. Or it might be giving them a role. So like timekeeper, making sure that everyone is quiet when we're ready to learn the next thing. So empowering them to use their want to be heard in a positive way. Yeah, that's a great strategy. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about your time as a youth worker? And is there anything from that time that informs your teaching of adults today? I feel like you've kind of shared a little bit of that. Mm, I think the big one... And it's probably going to sound really straightforward, but I think it's easy as a teacher to get into this thing of there's humans that come into a room and I'm teaching the humans. And then I think through youth work and really appreciating everyone's unique experience and the issues that they might come in with and the strengths they might come in with and being able to really see each individual within a group environment and where they're at and speak to that. And not in a necessarily obvious way, but give enough variations in the cues that you give or in the examples you give to cater to different learning styles and different personalities and also creating a space that's safe for someone to dip out if they need to or to take care of themselves and encouraging people to take care of themselves and I think a lot of that comes from working with really challenging young people or a combination of disadvantaged communities and what they need to feel safe in a space and then trying to bring that into a class environment. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, even in not necessarily an actual trauma-sensitive class, you don't know what people have had going on in their background before they get there. Mm. And so it's so powerful responding to who's actually there and Mm. what they need at that moment. And also to be able to intuit that and weave it into your teaching. And when you're doing this in the classes of yours that I've been to, there's no sense of wheels turning on the inside. Like, it seems really spontaneous Mm. and playful and we're all just here to have fun. Yeah. And I think the other thing is asking for permission, but not in a creepy way. Yeah. (laughs) Because it can be like, so I need to adjust you. Can I touch you now? Like, that's a bit confronting, but to be like... And that's a lot of words. That really slows down the flow of the class. So it can be, you know, are you comfortable with me guiding your arm? Are you comfortable with me drawing, you know... Do you mind if I just show you the line, the who has to travel with my, you know, thing? Like just gently asking permission and also asking people for permission for corrections because some people are happy just to play. Like they might not be doing the move right in like in 
you know, quotation marks, but they might not want to. And that's also so where that's movements okay. come from in yeah. everything. It's like a really new discipline. And those little mm. like mistakes and mishaps end up being and something really cool. And yeah. in any creative movement. So it's not about going, so Joe, you, you're actually holding the hoop a bit wrong and you need to lift your elbow up a bit more. It's like, are you exploring movement or are you wanting some guidance to work towards what, what I've explained? Or are you having a play, you know, and actually feeling out where people are at because not everyone is trying to do the thing that you think everyone is meant to be doing in class. Perhaps you could tell us about how you actually came across hooping and started getting into that. Yeah, I'm laughing because I'm so used to people, like I I ask this question a lot of other hoopers and it's often that I saw someone at a festival and I really just knew I wanted to do it or I picked up a hoop and I fell in love straight away and it's all, I feel like there's all these love stories. And I don't have one. <laughs> Mine's like the opposite. Mine's like a hate story. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got into hooping because I'd started training with the women's circus in their general sort of new women's program and tried out all different stuff and trained for a year. And after a year, it was it suggested that you choose a particular circus area to develop more in your practice. So I was like, aerials, I want to fly through the air. I want to be strong. I want to do all this crazy epic stuff. It's amazing. I'm going to sign up for next term. This is great. And then about a week or two before that term started, I somehow got a shoulder injury. I still don't know what I did. It wasn't like a sudden thing. It was like gradual and then I couldn't move my arm properly. And so I went to the first class and they were like, you can't lift your arm more than about 10 or 20 centimeters so you can't do yeah this, this isn't good this isn't going to work like you can't be a one-armed aerialist right now given that you know you're just starting and that's not what this is about and you're going to hurt yourself and I said well what can I do because I don't want to stop circus like I love this and I love the community that's here at the women's circus and they said oh you can hula hoop we've got a hula hooping class starting as well and you can join that and I was mortified I was like yeah great I'm just gonna stand with this plastic circle and just like wiggle around a bit and you're all gonna fly through the air and like oh. <laughs> whatever oh grounded <laughs> and yeah and so I kind of unwillingly went to classes and I didn't love it the first class or even the second class and probably not for quite a few classes and then someone suggested also exploring hoop dance not just circus hooping and then I found and then I found the flow and then I found the passion and then I was yeah it was like a a happy accident and so do you want to just tell us what you love about hooping now I feel like it changes every day actually (laughs) right now I love that it I like that there's there doesn't have to be a right and wrong there doesn't have to be a perfect there can just be a journey I like that you can also train really hard and get really fit doing it and you can train all you know exercise and tone all different parts of your body and I also like that there's a there's like a giggle element there's like a very playful giggly joyous thing that happens and I like that the more frustrated I get the more I'll drop my hoop until it gets to a point where I have to laugh at myself and relax and let go and then start again and I think I also like that it's a it's a sort of safe maybe doorway into flow like it's a safe way to explore movement because there's a prop to hide behind and so also it's, it's your body a prop to play with and a prop to play with and to be inspired by and to explore and go what would happen if what would happen if I stuck my foot in there what would happen if I climbed through there what would happen if I threw it away then what would I do you know what would happen if I reversed everything and yeah so it's kind of inspiring and I feel like I learn a lot about myself so when I I know where I'm at by what happens when I hoop and also about other people because I share hooping so much. I learn so much about where other people are at. And so many times I'll say to someone, this move will work the minute you take a breath and let go. And they're like, that's the story of my life. You know, <laughs> and that's yeah. what the hoop is. Like, yeah, it yeah. teaches you that. And you've already got into this a little bit, but are there any benefits of hooping that people might not be aware of? This is like a five-hour conversation if we go too <laughs> deep. I, the way I think about it, there's layers. So there's physical benefits, which is about moving and staying fit and toning and cardio and all of those kind of things. And then there's, I don't know if spiritual is the right word, but meditative benefits because with breath and repetitive movement can come a stillness. So I think that's a real benefit that movement meditation aspect yeah, of it. yeah where everything can be still inside even though the body's moving and that that's the pathway to that which is great for me because I can't sit still and don't meditate sitting still <laughs> um probably need to practice that and I think also emotionally it can be a really good way to process something 
just to move through it and that would be the same for dance it's not necessarily just hooping and the other thing is around neuroplasticity so training different pathways in the brain and being able to do different things with different hands or anticipating the next move and finding that brain body connection and then if you look into neuroplasticity and flow there's all the benefits associated with all of that as well which I won't go into right now we'll be here forever (laughs) maybe I know there's a couple of great articles about that so we might put Mm. some links in at Mm. the end including one you've written you're still doing work with younger people has your approach changed now with your hooping? I don't work with young people so much anymore in a youth work capacity, but I have the opportunity to work with young people in a hooping capacity, mm-hmm. which is quite interesting in its own way. And it's been it's been good because the feedback I've got is that, you know, you can't walk into a room of young people and expect them to do what you want. You have to kind of go guide them, but also be guided by them. So it can't be a strict workshop this is how it's run and what was the question how's it affecting how I teach now Mm. how I teach adults I think it's like I said before just around being able to see each person as unique and meet them where they're at and value value where they're at and actually sometimes it's about realizing that even though I'm in a role as a teacher we're all teachers so I'm learning as much from my students and who they are in the world no matter what their age as they are from me and in different ways and being open to that so there's not like this pedestal there's not like the teacher yeah, not like a hierarchy a student. Mm-hmm. yeah it's like a human interaction where we're learning from each other in different ways and before you were just professional hula hooping superstar <laughs> um, I know that you're a general manager of business how has that time in the corporate world informed how you run your mm. own business today Yeah, it's a good question. So I was general manager of business development for a national not-for-profit, which meant my job was to raise about two and a half million dollars a year for a mental health organization. And what it, what it actually taught me, and I can't, I don't know, this seems to be a bit of a theme, no surprises there, but it taught me that humans are humans are humans because until that job, so I got into that sort of work because I was annoyed that youth programs weren't getting the funding they deserved. So I started trying to get funding for my programs and then ended up being good at that and ended up doing this kind of business development thing and it's like up until that point because I'm a very colorful creative person I'd always looked at someone in a suit and gone you're not like me Mm -hmm. you're the other you're this other part of the world that I've chosen not to participate in because I you know because of whatever and what I actually learned particularly from my role as general manager of business development is that because I had to go in and I had to try and get money from these people that weren't anything like me and they were in suits and whatever, the easiest way to do that was to look like them, yeah? So suddenly I was that person at 9am on Burke Street rushing to a meeting in heels that I had to learn how to walk in and some kind of suit feeling like I was playing dress-ups and meeting other people that I realised were actually probably doing the same, Yeah, you know, and then having conversations with these humans that wasn't even about getting money, it was actually forming a relationship and realising that they've got this whole world and they've got like some fitness passion or some quirky creative thing they do on the side or whatever. And then that has allowed me to really, I mean, I don't think I'm, I don't think I am completely not judging people because I think we all do that all the time, but it's, I catch myself more often and go, no, because... You've learned that humans are humans are humans, no matter what we're wearing or what we're doing. And so I feel like I've, that was a big thing I learned in that role. And then I learned a lot about business and marketing. And I think that's impacted and supported the way that I do what I do and also the way that I support other people to do what they're doing. Because that's part of what you do as well. Like you consult with other yeah. people. And coach and yeah, support and do a whole bunch of strategy and policy and all kinds of marketing stuff. You do have a lot going on at all times. <laughs> do you have any strategies for managing and prioritizing your time? Yeah. I've tried a lot of things. At the moment, I've at the moment I've decided that sleep is a priority, which I've never done before, and that means 7 or 8 hours, which that's a whole new world to me. Oh, I couldn't even. It function. feels amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm a real person. <laughs> Life's less stressful. But also, like, how to do that is always my challenge. So how, you know, even though we all know we're working towards, like, a work-life balance and time for friends and family as well as our business and creativity and our own practice and, like, that's all easy to say, but how do you actually do that 
and stick to doing that. And so I'm, I write a lot of lists. I write a lot of checklists. I do a lot of things in my calendar where I'll block out time for a specific thing and then I'll put notes inside that. So instead of having lots of tasks in my calendar, which looks overwhelming, I'll have a chunk, which might say admin. And then within that, I'll have the list of things, but it's not immediately visible, like in my digital calendar. And then sometimes I feel like I need to see it because I want the pleasure of ticking it off in like a pink pen or something. So I'll write it out. But I think, I don't know, I use, I kind of go back to this analogy a lot that someone said to me once when I've got a lot on and I, and it's about focusing on the big rocks. Have you heard of this? Yes, yes, but say it. Yeah. So it's like if you had a giant fishbowl and you filled it with heaps of tiny stones, it would be really difficult, if not impossible, to put a big rock in there because there's nowhere for it to go. But if you start by putting a big rock in there and then you put the smaller stones around it and medium stones and whatever, then there's room for the big thing and there's room for some of the little things. Those little things will just fall into the cracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll kind of slip in around and whatever. And so it's sort of like, and I do this sometimes on a day, like I might look at my day and go, what's the main thing that absolutely must get done today, no matter what? And then what can I fit around it? Or I might look at the week like that or the month, depending on what I'm trying to achieve. I'm not sure if you still do this, but I remember you telling me how the first two hours of your day are kind of... You've got this nice little ritual of things that you do every day. Do <laughs> you want to share that? Yes, that ritual is still blocked out in my diary every day. I just don't get to do it very often at the moment. Oh, no. But um, it is still there and it's in, an intention and I work towards doing that. So that two hours is in a perfect world, which is what I'm going to focus on, not in the real world right now, because this is what I'm trying to achieve again is in that first two hours, there's no email checking, there's no phone stuff, there's none of that. It's about journaling, stretching, doing some trigger point stuff, doing my own practice with my hoop, taking my dog for a walk, getting outside, making a nice brekkie, having a shower, and then starting the day. And that's like, in an ideal world, if I do that every day, I'm a much nicer person. And it's like you've already taken that time for you at the beginning of the day because that's often the thing that gets just pushed off the end of the Mm. list. But doing that and fitting in seven or eight hours sleep is proving to be a challenge. Yeah, I I think I'd have to get up at 4am to do that. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. it's really tricky. And then that means if you want enough sleep, it means going to bed at like nine, Mm. which Mm. I don't get home usually till 10 from teaching. So yeah, it's like, do you prioritize rest or do you prioritize Mm. the activity Mm. and the meantime? Like mm. what's more important and food as well so the other thing I do which helps my week and my time management is I'll do all my groceries on a Sunday and I'll pre-prepare most of my food for the week on a Sunday so that when I'm running in and out I've got it ready to go and because I can't when I'm busy I find it hard to think about what I should put in my body I'll just grab like a piece of toast or a thing or and so I also write like a little meal map for the week so that when I'm busy I'm like ah, yeah, what, what am, am I gonna, gonna eat for lunch <laughs> oh wait this and I've got it in the cupboard because I planned it and then I just do this and now I'm now I'm okay. Have you got any just favourite go to healthy delicious meal ideas that would be great for other yes. teachers? So often what I, I don't know what they're called. They're just like a Super Bowl. That sounds like baseball. I don't know what they are. But it's like cook one or two types of grains and just have that in a container. Like quinoa and brown rice or something like that. something like that. And then, I don't know, I pick and choose, but maybe you might just have lentils or you might have tofu or something that's proteiny. And whether you've cooked it or it's ready in a can or like whatever you do, have that in another kind of container. And then I'll just have maybe I'll roast cauliflower because it's really quick and then it's done and it keeps. Or steam some green veggies and have them in a container. So I just put lots of things like that in containers. And then I might grate some carrots so there's some fresh stuff. And then I'll have some kimchi or sauerkraut or wakame, like some kind of pickledy something. And then if that's all done and it doesn't take that long to do, then you get home or just before you teach and you chuck some of the grains in the bowl. And then you chuck a bit out of all the containers. And then you've kind of got everything you need. And you can put some lemon juice or tahini or hummus, like chuck, whatever's in the fridge. Done. And it's still all like fresh and, and buried and crunchy because that's yeah. been like slopping around in juice all week. Speaking of crunchy, I've got a new thing that someone just showed me. You get a rice cracker mm-hmm. and you just break it up, crunch it up, or use what's left in the bag and sprinkle that on your food. Because oh, mm-hmm. crunchy crunch. is often the missing element in the healthy bowl. Yeah, that's a great it's idea. Yeah, it's really good. I'm feeling getting ideas for dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah, you also told me about another good one, which is mm. when you make a big smoothie, freeze some of your smoothie yeah. because uh. that, you know, ready to go. Yeah. 
And same with bliss balls because you can freeze them. So I'll make a big batch of bliss balls and I choose not to put dates or anything too sweet. So I'll just use coconut oil to bind them so that it's not a a big sugar thing. Mm -hmm. You can put protein powder in there as well. Whatever else you want, nuts. Blend it up, make your bliss balls, chuck them in the freezer, and then when you're leaving the house in the morning, put a couple in a container to go in your bag. Done. Great idea. Mm. Do you have any other self-care strategies where you feel like burnout is impending upon you? Anything <laughs> to kind of like turn that around and... Leave the city. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave the city. Like I... Get out of town. I didn't grow up in a city. I managed to be in a city because... There's lots of parks and I have a dog and I get out and about. But yeah, when it's all starting to feel overwhelming, I feel like a city adds to that because there's concrete and there's buildings and everything's around. And so just go. And even yesterday, like I didn't have a lot of time, but I just went and visited some friends in Castlemaine for the day and just sat there watching the storm come through, you know, hanging out. And even the drive is nice. Like the drive, driving through country areas is just and that's also a time when you're not checking your emails, you're not replying to messages. Yeah, you better not be. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I really love this description of the Hoop Sparks approach from your website. Using play as a foundation for learning and connection, encouraging individual expression, exploration and creativity, utilising hula hoop dance as a tool to reflect and to change or challenge our thinking. Mm. Could you elaborate on how this plays out in your class, in your planning? Your class planning, as it were. Yeah. So I, when I'm planning my classes, I always plan the whole term in one go so that there's a flow even from week to week. It doesn't mean the movements connect, but there's something about the shape or the energy. I feel like it's a sculpture. Um, No one can see me because we're doing a recording, but I'm using my hands a lot in my (laughs) hair trying to describe what I'm talking about. So... Oh, with the play element, I will think of either partner activities or little games that I can weave through. And some terms, depending on the group, I'll sort of do that weekly and other terms I'll do it fortnightly. But I always make sure that I have three or four classes in an eight week term that have some kind of game kind of element. And the nice thing about those are like, that's all levels. Like that could be your very first hoop class and you can still play that silly game just as well as anyone else. Totally. And I'm also not afraid of introducing play that doesn't involve a hoop so you know I'll always say I know you came to hoop class to play with a hoop but for the next five minutes we're not going to play with a hoop you know like we're going to do this other thing to try and unlock this feeling to then re-enter our hoop. I think in terms of encouraging individual expression I try just to make that really clear that that's okay if this fascinates you go there you know and if this is fascinating you you don't have to move on to the next move I'm teaching like stay with it explore it have a play you know I had one class it was this person's first class and we were just learning a technique for getting up and down off the floor and part of that involves a rolling movement to use the momentum of the roll to get up anyway she loved rolling on the floor that she literally stayed there for 20 minutes we'd already learnt like two or three other moves and she was just happy in this rolling puddle on the floor <laughs> and that's sort of when I know that like I've managed to create that space for people yeah that they can totally that they feel comfortable just like rolling around on the yeah. floor when the rest of the group's doing something else yeah she was a 45 year old woman who'd barely done any movement in her life and came to a hoop class and spent the first just found her bliss 20 <laughs> minutes yeah. rolling on the floor without a hula hoop and then I think the utilising hoop dance as a tool to reflect or change or challenge our thinking is I'll often witness or observe something in the way someone's moving their body or using their breath and I'll maybe ask a question so rather than saying you need to do this hey you look tense (laughs) what would happen if you breathed with that move or what would happen if you put your focus here or what would happen if you did this so and also, I also challenge people's thinking, I think, with women. I mean, l- lots of people, but particularly women, say sorry a lot in our culture. And so that's something I kind of bring into my class. If I notice someone's apologising a lot for nothing, really, like they dropped their hoop, they stepped in front of someone to pick it up, they walked too close to someone in their Even if they like, want to ask you a question, yeah, often sorry. it starts with a sorry. Yeah, and so I just make it really clear that, like, you know, like just what I've said now, like I just name it that... You know, now that I've said this, you'll probably notice it, but women are often very apologetic. So, let you know, just be mindful of that. And I challenge you not to apologise in this class. Um, and I got this from Gail O'Brien, but unless someone's crying or bleeding, <laughs> don't apologise. <laughs> and also the thing around the I can't mentality. Like, I can't do that. Instead of I can't yet, or I can't because I didn't understand what you just said, or I can't because I haven't practised enough. I can't is like something I'll really challenge in class, and I'll very directly do that. 
And just something I've noticed with the structure of your class, mm. you tend to introduce a foundational move, a few different variations, so that different people at different levels of experience will all have something to work on. And then it's kind of like, okay, now it's your time to play and my time to come around if anyone needs individual attention. Mm. And it's such a great way to do it because the people who've got it can be creative and just play with bringing it into their flow. The people who haven't got it yet don't feel like they're slowing down the rest of the group because mm. everyone's just off doing their own thing. And it's kind of this really inclusive sense of like, yeah, we're all on our own journey, but we're all here together. We're all learning mm. and playing and it's a lovely thing to be a part of. Mm. And I think it really puts people at ease just to enjoy where they're at. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's very challenging to plan classes like that. Some moves don't have an obvious foundation and progression. Like, you're yeah. really great at mm. coming up with new ones. Yeah. <laughs> That's because I like to play and because I don't think of it as a right and a wrong. It's like, well, maybe you can just do this. Or if someone's, like, definitely got a certain move, it's like, okay, are you happy there or do you feel like a challenge? And, it's, again, it's that asking, like, what do you want now? Not what do I think you need right now because you know you better than I know you. And if someone's like, yeah, I want a challenge, it might be like, okay, well, can you reverse that whole thing? Or what would happen if you tried to do that particular movement but somehow behind your back? And people will look at me like, what, is that even possible? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but, like, try. Maybe it is. Maybe you'll invent something. I don't know. But, like... Push past your comfort zone and see what's there. I guess as well, get beyond that sense of you're here to learn from me and get into, well, let's see what you can discover about mm. yourself or mm. about mm -hmm. this movement. And how can I encourage you to feel safe in exploring your own movement and your own body and the way it works? Because mm. it's quite an interesting, I guess, movement discipline. Like yoga is very much, this is your practice for yourself. Mm. But hooping is a performance art as well. As well. So there is definitely an element of aesthetics mm -hmm. and how you make this move look as good as it can. And that could be about cleaning up the plane that you're moving in or just maybe being a bit more of your posture, which is also a good self-care thing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in that same group, it's like someone is performing and someone else is very much on that inside meditative space. Mm -hmm. And there's room for both. And when they're just like doing something weird. Like yeah holding the hoop and swinging it for five minutes because it feels nice and they're wondering what will happen next. Yeah, you're <laughs> rolling around on the ground for 20 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> Is there anything that you do to stay inspired and to stay creative? So on a class-by-class -class basis, which I guess is what you've kind of got into a little bit of like thinking of the flow of the whole term, but any strategies that you can dig into when just stuff isn't flowing for you? For me as a teacher or in my own practice, do you mean? I reckon they're probably similar. Both, Yeah. I or do you sometimes have a disconnect where your own practice is going great, but you have no ideas for class? No, I usually have an abundance of ideas for class. My challenge is stripping back my ideas to something that's manageable in an eight-week term. So I could I mean, an hour and a half yeah, class. Like yeah. I could, my if I wanted to, if I could teach everything I wanted, it'd probably be like three-hour classes for eight weeks, kind of thing. So I have to strip it back because um, I do have a tendency to want to pack too much in and it gets overwhelming. I think when I get stuck, so when a class isn't going as I planned it or when I'm noticing that the energy is really low or something like that, sometimes I'll stay with the same movement but sort of shift the energy. So if people are feeling a bit tired and it's really hot, I'll focus on doing really doing the same movement but slowly or adding a balance or adding a pause or exploring stillness within it and I'll use different music often to help do that. If things are just not happening as I thought and something's way harder for people than I imagined or there's five beginners that have just shown up in an all-levels class that's been running for five weeks or whatever, that's when I'll often throw in a game and then sort of think about like what to do next. Yeah. Or I'll pick up on a movement that I've noticed someone doing and then I'll use that to inform what happens next and go with that. With my own practice, I also don't really get stuck so much because I think I just ask a lot of questions. That that's your process. Yeah, so if I'm doing a particular move that I've done lots and I can't think of, if I'm like, I'm bored, I don't really want to learn this new thing, I want to do it there. We're like, okay, well, what's a move I like? And then, like I said before, what would happen if I did it in reverse? What would happen if I tried to include my foot? What would happen if I tried to add a turn? What would happen if I tried to do it behind my back? And none of that has to be, like, a logical progression. Like, it can be really kind of creative thinking, but that's just, like, a spark for something new to come. 
Is there anything that you do for yourself personally just to get yourself in the right state of mind to teach? Like, say you've had a really (laughs) terrible day, you got caught in traffic, you've got 15 minutes before class. Is there anything that you could do for yourself that you could share with other people? I've had a lot of stuff going on before I teach, and I never feel like I have 15 minutes to sort it out. It's like if I had 15 minutes, (laughs) it wouldn't be an issue. If I had 15 minutes, things would be possibly good. Like, I think it's still fine, but often I have maybe three minutes or five minutes or, you know, something if there's something like stressful happening or emotional happening or something. And... My and sometimes I arrive and students are there before me as well, so there's it has to be a real internal process. And for me, it's just breath like, I'll really just take a minute to just like breathe and then think about the movement patterns that I'll be like, really just go straight into the thinking of the class like, land in my body, breathe, what's the movement, and start to kind of picture that, and then I'm ready. Nice, mm. something I find really helpful for me as well. Often I'm getting public transport to class and just if I know I'm not in the right headspace, like I've got some favorite tunes that I just know can help me like get into that zone. Yeah. And also actually the warm up that I run is it's, I always have something planned, but often I'll change it based on how I'm feeling in myself or in my body. So if I'm feeling like I need something more breathy or something more physical or something to help me just get over whatever's just happened in my day, I'll use the warm up for that a little bit. Yeah. That's a really good strategy. And so often you'll do something that's totally dictated by your own needs and then afterwards someone will be like, that's exactly what I needed tonight. Thank (laughs) you so much. You've already kind of mentioned how performance is challenging (laughs) and there's hooping for yourself, say, in the park, purely for fun. Mm -hmm. And then there's something that you film. Mm -hmm. Is there like a little bit of a different headspace for all of those things or... Can I kind of talk a little it's bit about the differences? Usually when I film myself, and this is the same with performing actually, so filming and performing is similar, I think of it as if I'm performing, I'm very comfortable thinking of it as people witnessing my play and it's the same in front of a camera. I've been playing for a while now, so I'm going to set up a camera and then people can witness my play and then I'll edit out the kind of chaos or the awkward moments where I'm just doing something because it feels nice but looks really odd or whatever and then that's... And And sometimes you don't realise, like, what is actually going to look amazing when it is just you playing around. Yeah, so I kind of don't think about it too much. It's more just, like, witnessing play. And I've just come today from a four-hour performance workshop and it was really interesting because at the start I said, I'm I'm here because I'm actually really uncomfortable with performing. And, like, half the room was like, but you're a performer. Yeah, you're already doing this. Like, you do this. And I was like, yeah, but it's more like I just let people watch me play. And so then by the end of it, it was sort of like being able to start to own that actually you don't have to be solo on stage to be performing. Like, teaching is performing, robing is performing, doing a massive circus, circus and physical theatre production with 20 other women is on a stage is performing like (laughs) it's like don't know you're performing and I'm like no 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 I'm just letting people witness me play (laughs) (laughs) and I think of that with um video as well do you want to go into a little bit about your time with women's circus which is obviously still Mm. going on because it sounds Mm. like it's been really formative for you I think the women's circus is amazing because they create a safe space to learn with no prerequisites so I'd never done circus, I'd never done gymnastics, I didn't have formal dance training, I didn't have formal theatre training. It's sort of like went in there and I played. The new women's program, you spend a lot of time playing physical games and then I guess getting more confident with your body moving and then playing with the apparatus and things like that. It's been a huge part of my life because it's been my entrance into circus and it's what introduced me to hooping even though I was very unwilling. And I think the trainers... It's not all about the skill you're learning. It's about feeling safe in your body and getting to know your body and doing things safely and in a supported way. So that's really beneficial. And, and then it's a community as well. It's not just... For, I mean, it's different for everyone. For me, it's not about just going to class, training, going home. It's like there's a community there and, you know, you get to know the other women and what's happening in their lives and you support one another. And as a member of the Women's Circus... And you don't have to be a training member, you can just be a member, but it gives you opportunities to access the space and do open training, like just as you want with other people, meet other people, and then opportunities to participate in 
<laughs> I'm like, oh yes, in performance. I'm always like, in witnessing play, no. <laughs> um, in performance, you know, and helping people develop those skills. And the other thing that's been really incredible more recently is they're doing a lot more inclusive practice stuff. So the opportunity to work with people that whose bodies move in a different way to mine or who maybe communicate in a different way to me like through sign language or something else and how that plays out when you're working physically with people and how different bodies engage with one another when there's different like mixed sort of ability and, and different abilities in the in the group and that's been really powerful as well so it's yeah yeah it sounds pretty beautiful. great mm. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty great yeah this is a slight change of direction, but we've spoken a little bit about you filming and sharing and just want to kind of delve into a little bit about mm. social media and how it can be an amazing source of inspiration and sharing, but how it can also bring up a lot of insecurities and... I think it's a strange phenomenon. <laughs> it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I guess because I'm a bit of a... It's weird, like I'm a perfectionist, but also my motto is done is better than perfect. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to like reshoot a video and re-edit it 10 times to get it perfect. I'll be like, yeah, whatever. Like some people are going to watch it and then it'll be gone in five minutes. Like mm. it's over, you know, they're on to the next thing and... And you share um, on a really regular basis as well. Do you mm, put something out every day? Mm, yeah, so there's something out every day. I think I don't the the insecurity occasionally if there's an insecurity that comes up because I feel like that's the interesting thing to explore a little bit is I think it taps into that stuff that most of us struggle with of like am I good enough? Is this good enough? You know, do people like it? Da, da, da. And I think that it's a nice kind of space to go into because what it does for me is every time I notice those questions sitting there, it gives me the opportunity to go, what are you doing this for, actually? And the answer is always because I love it and I want to share and I want other people to have the opportunity to explore through this plastic circle that has given me so much. And then it becomes, and then I have to laugh at myself and go, well, it's irrelevant. It's actually irrelevant, like, whether people like you, whether you're good enough, whether whatever. The fact is, is, like, this is your passion, and if you share it, you might inspire others. And, you know, and I deliberately make myself not edit out the drop sometimes. Like, let people see that you drop the hoop. It's okay, you know? Let, I think I did one video once where I was trying to film this move that I just worked out, and every single time I did it, and I don't know why this happened. I think maybe I was unwell that day. I don't know. It wasn't a turning move. But every time I did this move, I fall over backwards and land on my butt. <laughs> so on the video, there's just... And every time I was shocked because I was like, why did that happen? How did that happen? Again. <laughs> and then I get up and I do it again and exactly the same thing would happen. And my dog was like next to me just watching. And you can see her in the video just like looking at me. What are you doing? <laughs> what is happening? And I didn't post that video immediately when I'd filmed it. I think it might have even been something I sort of posted like many months later because I was like, you know what? Like, this is actually really funny. And this is the reality of what we do. You know, we're not all just, like, polished and beautiful and amazing all the time. Sometimes really hilarious things happen. Like, we stand in a park and we fall over repeatedly for no reason at all. And, like, that's okay. You know? So I think with social media, it's a challenge for me to keep showing myself. Like, like all, like, you know, not just the good Not the edited that, version. Not the edited version all the time. Yeah. Do you ever look back over stuff that you've done like a year ago and kind of use it as a bit of a like visual diary? I go back sometimes just because and I'm like, whoa, what was that? What was that thing that I didn't notice that I did that day when I was jamming? And I'll watch it over and over and it'll take me forever to work it out and then that'll inform my classes. Like often when I design my classes or I'm looking for inspiration for my own practice, I go back to old videos because there's stuff in there that I'd forgotten, there's stuff in there that I'd never noticed that I'd kind of accidentally done that's actually interesting or or whatever. So do you have any tips for teachers aiming to use social media to help promote or build their burgeoning business? Yeah, I guess it's like never ask a digital marketing consultant this Uh question, (laughs) (laughs) which is what I do. Um, I would say have a strategy, so know what you want to say, know who you're saying it to, and have and and actually sit down and plan what that means look at insights and use them so you know when your audience is online post at those times when most people most of your audience is online and so is this on facebook facebook and instagram Mm -hmm. and then also and this is more a time management thing 
And, you know, people can choose whether they do it weekly or monthly or whatever. Rather than, say, if you want to post every day because you want to have that presence and that's in line with the strategy that you've already developed, (laughs) then instead of every day going, oh, what was it I was going to post today and then crafting that and then having to write the thing and do all the things and whatever, sit down at the start of the week and go, right, what am I doing for the week? And just schedule it all. Because then you're in the right headspace, you've got that thinking, you do it in one chunk and it's done. And you might choose to do it weekly or fortnightly or monthly. And then instead of having to scramble for time in the day to do this thing and get it out and of like the And like remember to do it every day. To do it, you've got your little plan, you know what your goal is for the month, you know what you want people to do, you know the kind of message you want to give, and then you go with it. Have you got any exciting plans for the future that you'd like to share? Oh my gosh, so (laughs) many! One of the exciting things next year is I'm changing the structure of how Hoopsparks operate. So instead of having classes four nights a week, there'll be classes one night a week and there'll be a parallel workshop stream on weekends that are probably every three weeks. So people can either come to the weekend workshops and sign up for the workshop series in advance, pick and choose what they want to come to, what is fascinating for them at that moment, and or come to weekly classes. And then also putting, I guess, a little bit more focus on private sessions or small group sessions with people at times that they choose. And the other exciting plan is organising a hoop retreat in winter. Oh. Mm. Which will be a bit of a, you know, I always sort of think in winter it's like the hoops freeze, like the sun goes away, <laughs> you don't have space in your house, and I just picture them sitting in the corner with like icicles <laughs> coming oh, well, down, yeah, all the things. It's like some weird kind of winter hoop horror movie. So, yeah, with Halley Hoops, the plan is to create a winter retreat, hopefully not more than an hour and a half drive out of Melbourne, um, that would maybe have 12 or 15, space for 12 or 15 people and combine a little bit of yoga and Pilates and that kind of thing as well and have a little winter getaway. Yeah, so that's exciting. And I'm super excited about that one. Yeah, it's <laughs> going to be great. And I think the other exciting plan is that I'm going to live out of Melbourne for a little while, so that's more a personal plan. I just want to get out of the city and just come back every three weeks, so that's pretty exciting for me. And also, when I was at Hoopy Happenings this year, I learned how to crack a whip, Mm -hmm. like a stock whip. (laughs) And it was great. Like, it (laughs) felt great. I was like, yes, this is a thing. And it feels like flow. Like, there's there's similar linear and circular movement in cracking a whip that feels like it could... Like, I want to explore that. So it's great, because next year... I'll have heaps of space. I'll have all this space. So I'm going to crack whips, possibly learn dragon stuff, which I picked up for the first time the other day and got quite fascinated with the contact movement of that. And do heaps of hooping and learn how to kind of live a bit more off the land and a little bit less in a consumery way. And then, and then beyond that, I don't know. Which sounds is, like a great six-month plan, though. It's also mm-hmm. exciting because usually yeah. I know. I know what I'm doing, like, well in advance. And I'm broken like, it down into subtasks. <laughs> totally. And there's lists and there's all the things. There's probably a spreadsheet or two, <laughs> colour-coded. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so it's kind of like beyond the first six months of next year, I'm not sure what will happen, but I know. And there's also an inkling that maybe I will create a solo performance piece that won't be, ta-da, here's my thing. It'll be maybe building on something that I started earlier this year that is... It's a hoop dance piece to a spoken word thing that I've written about hooping and maybe exploring that sort of arty, mm. arty side of it all and not having... Having it a space to yeah. explore and play. Having some, So I don't really know, but that all feels exciting to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Say someone walks in off the street into one of your workshops, I've never been to one of your classes before, what's the one thing that you'd really like them to take away from your class, from your teachings? That they're capable of more than what they imagine. Yeah, that sounds great. (laughs) Yeah, excellent. So I guess that brings us to our pick of the week. My pick of the week is the movie that we watched last night. It's Hidden Figures. It's a um, movie about three African-American women who work for NASA. And uh, one of them, Katherine Johnson in particular, if it wasn't for her, the rocket launch with John Glenn into space, into Earth orbit, might not have happened. So uh, it's a really amazing movie based on the book of the same name by Margot Lee Shetterly. 
really worth a, a look. Janelle Monáe's in it as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. Like civil rights is in the foreground and the background, but it's also just a story about these women's lives and this weird little look inside NASA. It was great. <laughs> My pick of the week is the Cirque Physio, Jennifer Crane. Her website is just cirquephysio.com. And she was an excellent discovery for me. She's a physiotherapist and a circus performer. And she does lots of great free content, which is often about waking up a specific muscle or a self-massage technique that you can use. And so much of it is applicable in yoga, in Pilates, in everyday movement. So, you know, if you're building up to do a one-armed handstand, you've got to prime your hands and your wrists and your shoulders for that. But all those exercises are amazing if you just want to do a downward facing dog pose or if you realize you can't lift your arm up very high anymore. And all the things that she does are multi-leveled. So there'll be a variation that even if you didn't really do a lot of physical movement or circus but had like an achy hip you wanted to work on, you could still get benefit from. Or if you're a elite level contortionist, there'll be something else there for you which would just be a progression or a variation of the same move. So yep, Cirque Physio is amazing and amazing at explaining anatomy in a way that makes a lot of sense and giving you a movement that you then feel that information in your body. I think my pick of the week would be Women's Circus. Yeah, good pick. Yeah, that's it really. I just, <laughs> for all the reasons I talked about before, mm -hmm. um, there's opportunities to get involved in classes, there's one-off workshops, it's a really supportive space to start to explore your body or explore your body in different ways. And it's really supportive um, and safe. And also they put on yeah. shows that you can go and see. And there's also shows. In fact, there's a, they've got their end of year cabaret event coming up. Maybe we can put the little link we in sure will. as well. Yes. It's the weekend of the 15th of December. So it's a bit of a showcase of small group works and students from the year. Um, and what they've put together as a little showcase for the end of the year. So Are you going to be in it? I'm not going to be in it this year. No, I haven't been training with them regularly for the last term. So, you, yeah, so I'm not... Not I'm this not, time around. Not this time around, but I'm definitely going. And I've had the pleasure of seeing a little sneak preview today because they were rehearsing while I was in the space earlier and it's looking good. So that's my pick of the week. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Donna, and thank you for your inspiration every time I come to one of your Hulu classes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So much good information in this episode. I really love how Donna's approach is so permissive and how she really opens up a space for creative expression. We would love to hear your thoughts on this episode. What do you do in your classes to get the creative vibes flowing? You can drop a note on our website at podcast.flowartist.com or email us at podcast at flowartist.com. We're Flow Artist Podcast on Facebook or at Flow Artist on Twitter. We would love to hear from you. The theme song on this podcast is Baby Robots by Go Soul and used with much appreciated permission. Do yourself a favor and get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Thanks again. Big, big love.